Hey guys, welcome back, Skitzone series. I thought it was about time to do another lab video. Today's topic is going to be a countdown timer, a very simple project, but one that is more about synthesizing different things we've done in the past. So we have to grab user input, number of seconds to count down. Um, we have to be able to use our timing functions, some basic floating point math, and obviously printing out the timer as the time goes by. So printing floats as well. So again, a very simple project, but one that is perhaps useful and also helps cover a wide breadth of our previous topics. So one other thing about this is that we can turn this into a utility like we turned our other programs earlier in this series into utilities that we can call from anywhere on our machine. And so this one, the way I envision it is you type countdown or whatever you want to call it, timer or something, number of seconds, and it will begin immediately to count down that number of seconds and print out the number here with the decimal point and a fraction, so a floating point number. And then once it hits zero, it will say time's up and then return back to a, a usable command prompt. So that's how I see this working. And so it's not particularly challenging to do this and it only involves a couple of functions here that we've made in previous videos. So for timing, we have tick time and talk time. Those basically, you can see here what they do. Uh, tick time returns the current timestamp in RAX in microseconds, but it also saves that value somewhere in memory that you can access later. And that's what talk time does. It basically checks the current timestamp and then subtracts off tick time's timestamp and gives you the number of elapsed microseconds since tick. So it's a very MATLAB-esque implementation of tick and talk. So you call tick, you wait a while, you call talk, and it tells you how many microseconds have elapsed from tick to talk. Then we have parse int. Obviously, when we pass in this string here, countdown space 60, we have to break that into pieces, which actually um, the OS does for us. And then we have to still be able to parse this 60, which is just two ASCII characters into an actual decimal number. So from a string to a number. So that's what parse int does. It, you, you pass in a pointer to that character array and it checks it. It can check for hex numbers, binary numbers, whatever else. And it just returns the integer in RAX. Then obviously to print, we have our print float function from a previous episode. We use that all the time. And then our exit function that just literally exits the program. You need that to not return an error code when you end your program. So not very hard at all. We do have one thing to maybe talk about, and that is just a very simple algorithm and math here. So the user will pass in the number of seconds they want to count down from as a string, right? Or really, we're going to get it as an int when we parse it. That has to be a float for us to do some math on it, to compute subtraction and print it out. So that has to happen, that conversion. Thankfully, we have an instruction in our assembly language that converts from ints to floats. We'll talk about that today. And then also um, in our loop, we're printing out the number of seconds left in the timer. Um, obviously, talk time returns the number of microseconds that have elapsed as an integer. That has to also be a float. So we'll make that into a float in the same way. And then also we have to print out the number of seconds that have that we have remaining. And so that's just our input number of seconds minus this microsecond value divided by 1 million, and that's what we print out. So not a very advanced arithmetic here, but again, that's all we have to do. So let's begin. It should be pretty quick implementation here. So the idea behind this whole series is that you can, you don't have to do all this stuff that most people suggest you have to do for assembly language programming. You don't have to do inline assembly, you don't have to do things with the C runtime or linking stuff. Everything can be done from scratch. And that's what this entire Skitzone project is all about. And so when you get the code, download it, you'll have what you see here. And if you run this make bins shell script, it will populate a bunch of binaries in that bin directory that we can use um, just in general, but also for the software itself. And the idea is that what we're writing today will eventually put in that bin directory to be able to count down. So let's let's do that right now. Let's uh, go to this lab 
folder. And let's copy the template. You can see the template there. That's just a bare bones assembly file that just returns zero. So we can copy that and let's make a new folder. We'll call it um, countdown. So if I go in there, well, what do we have in our template? Basically we have a run script. All that does is uses NASM to make a binary from our code. So it literally just transcribes our assembly code into a binary directly. There's nothing fancy going on here. Um, and then we just, the next line there is we make it executable of that binary. That's just turning it, turning the, the bits in its permissions to say, yeah, you can execute this. Then we run it. So it's a very simple, straightforward process. There's nothing hard going on here. And then in the code, what is the code? So the code is just a bare bones um, setup, basic elf header, basic program header, a single include, which is basically the exit sys exit function, which uses the exit syscall, and then we execute that here. So if we run this, that will return zero. So we check the last return value and it says zero. So this is a bare bones program. So from here, we can start implementing our timer. What do we do? First, we have to include all those functions that we just mentioned. Let me pull those in really quick. So we need to include, first off, the printing function. So that's in lib io print float .asm. That basically goes to that file and copies and pastes the entire contents here. With some caveats, there's some macros there, some ifs. So it won't include this multiple times, but it will include it at least once. Then we have to include our parse int. That's in the same folder. Let's just grab that one. Lib io parse int. Then we have our tick and talk time. So let's grab those. So in include lib uh, time, I believe. Tick time. And then talk time. And that's probably it. All right, nothing else? Okay, so first things first is we have to be able to get user input. That's the most fundamental thing here. Pass the number of seconds to count down from. So how do we do that? Well, let me pull up one thing really quick. Um, I'll open up the lib sys Linux syscalls really quick so we can show you what's going on. So, oops. We have a bunch of OS specific things to find here. So Linux and FreeBSD. What I'm looking for here is basically this line here where we say def define. So we're defining a basically a, a value for the NASM assembler, kind of like a macro. Um, this sysargc start pointer. So basically this points, this value, whatever this number it is, in this case it's RSP, but this points to where is argc when the program starts. And so when a program starts, you have argc, which is the number of arguments or number of space separated things that you've hit enter on on the command line. So in this case, if you type in countdown seven, there will be two arguments that you've passed in. One is countdown and one is the string seven. And then after that, you have the argv, which is the actual pointers to the null terminated character arrays for the string countdown and the string seven. So basically, at RSP plus zero, you'll have argc. At RSP plus eight, you'll have the name of the function. And then at RSP plus 16, you'll have the string for how many seconds to count down. So first things first, let's just make sure we have um, a valid input. How about that? Or a valid situation. And so let's check that really quick. So if we if we go to that locase, location and we say uh, at sys argc, um, start pointer and we compare that with one the byte one just to see if we, if we have at least one input so if we have more than one we're good if we have one that's not enough because one would just be the program name so let's say compare I think if I say quad word because it's uh, eight bytes um, and then you can say jump less than or equal to quit so basically this says if we've passed in zero or somehow a negative number of arguments um, or one that's not enough for us to get a number of seconds from in that case just end the program however if we've um, passed in a valid 
number, so two or more, in which case we don't care about everything else. We only care about the, the second argument, which is the number of seconds. That would be, we can grab that and run our parse int. So if we go back, parse int, that grabs a character array at, pointed to by RDI and uh, returns the integer value of that string basically in RAX. And so we can put in RDI that pointer. So we can say move into RDI, sys argc start pointer plus 16. Again, plus eight would be the program name, plus 16 is the actual number of seconds. Uh, and then we can call parse int. And now in RAX should be the number of seconds in an integer format that the user wants to count down from. And we can check that. We can move into RDI or move yeah into RDI, RAX, and call exit. So this is just a quick check. We can see when we run this program, if we pass in nothing, we should return zero because we will have evaluated less than or equal to one and that will jump to quit. If we didn't pass in one or less arguments, we will parse the number in the second argument um, and return that value to the output. And of course, this is a maximum of like a 255, but we're gonna pass in a small number just to check. So let's do this. If I run this, it, com it compiles just fine. And if I, um, am I recording? Let me just check, I am. So we have a binary now. If I run that binary with no inputs, I should get an output of zero, which I do. If I run that binary with some input, let's say 55, I should get an output of 55. So that is big. We've now just taken a string input, turned it into an int, and returned it out, also having checked for the proper number of inputs. Well, maybe not proper, because I can still pass in like a bunch of inputs, right? I can say 55, uh, cow, monkey, banana, and it would still, I believe, just pass out 55. So we ignore everything beyond the second argument, which is fine, who cares? Um, back to the match. So what's next? We have the number of seconds to count down as an integer in RIX. The problem with that is basically whenever you do that, you, all our functions, well, system five ABI says that you return values in RIX. And so I don't like to keep values that are important in RIX if at all possible. So let's move into RCX. You don't have to do this, um, but let's just do that. Move into RCX, the value in RIX. That's just to save the number of, of seconds to count down. Is this important? Probably not. And we can ignore this. Should we ignore this? Uh, yeah, screw it. Let's ignore this, who cares? Um, instead of that, let's convert that immediately into a float. Because as we said before, it has to be a float for our math to make sense. So we're going to convert this into a float. So how do we do that? Move into, well, let's actually convert a scalar integer to a scalar double XMM one um, RX. So this says XMM one contains float four seconds total, for total seconds. I don't know, you count, whatever. You know what I mean? Um, also, in that in that math, we'll also need one other thing, and that is let me pull it up really quick. This number here, 186. You do know though, so we can store 186 in a in a register. That's fine, and keep dividing by it. That's no big deal. But more, what's better than that is instead of dividing by a number, we can multiply by the inverse. That's just way faster to do. So let's store the inverse of this number and multiply by that each iteration in the loop. So let's grab that in XMM2. So let's say um, move SD XMM2 something, let's call it millionth. And this will basically XMM2 contains one E negative six. So let's do that. Let's put that value here somewhere, millionth. And I'm pretty sure you can do just this fraction here. Is that it? Five zeros and a one, I think so. Okay, cool. Um, but also one other thing we should do is negative numbers don't make sense. You can't count down neg from negative five. So let's, let's check if it's positive first. So let's compare um, RAX with uh, zero. 
What should we do? If it's less than zero, jump to quit, or equal to zero, I guess, jump to quit. Otherwise, do this conversion and start our loop. So let's make a loop here. That will be our actual timing loop going on. Now let's think, what should we do first? Actually, before loop happens, we have to call tick, right? Tick is, so talk returns number of seconds or microseconds since tick. So you have to call tick first. Let's call tick time right here, call tick time. And at this point, REX has been obliterated because this returns the number of microseconds or whatever the timestamp in REX. So REX is now gone. We have no recollection of our integer number of seconds to count down. It's now gone, but who cares? We have that value saved as a float in XMM1. Okay, great. So the timestamp has been saved in tick. Now we can eventually call talk in our loop. So let's do that. Call talk time. And uh, why don't we just see if this works? Well, we can't really do it yet. Let's convert this to a float first and then we'll call print float um, to see if this works. Okay, um, so this returns number of microseconds in RAX. So let's say that here. Um, RAX contains number of microseconds elapsed. So let's convert this into a float like we talked about. So convert scalar into scale double XMM3. Again, I don't want to put anything XMM0 because XMM0 is an input to print float. And so I want to keep that clean. Otherwise I have to constantly push and pop these 16 byte floating point registers off and on the stack. So yeah, we're not going to use XMM0, we'll leave it in XMM3. So let's pass in um, the value in RIX. So now in XMM3 will be in, is a float number of microseconds that have elapsed. So it's a huge number. And then we can, uh, let's just print it out. How about that? Let's print it out and let's loop forever. So let's jump to loop. And then to print out stuff, we have to be able to pass in inputs. So XMM0 is the input. So move SD, XMM0, XMM3. This will put the number in XMM0 just for the time being. Um, move RDI, we have a standard out file descriptor, we can put that in here and then move RSI the number of digits to print. So we'll say, I don't know, seven, four, six, four, four is short, right? So let's do four. Um, and then call print float, sure. And then it's buffered printing. So we wanna print this every single time. So we'll say call um, print buffer flush, but also this will print them all on one line we could put a new line character down here. Let's do that so we can get it separated by each line. So let's say um, grammar db new line character. And we'll put that down here. We'll say move RSI grammar, move RDX one um, and call print characters. And this is actually included by print float so I don't have to include it separately here. It's a dependency of print flows. So that's that's fine. And this should print out a new line in between every float that we print. Let's see if this works. So let's do binary 15. So it's printing as a float, which is not really showing right here, but it's printing as a float, the four digit, most significant four digits of that float counted upwards. So this is what, six million? So this is six seconds that have elapsed since I hit enter there. Let's try that again. One, two, three, uh, one second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, five seconds. So you can see it's counting up as we expect. Cool, so everything's working as intended so far. Um, we're now able to count up in microseconds from our tick using talk in a loop. We didn't subtract off from our number of seconds to count down from, and we're still not counting um, in seconds, we're counting in microseconds. So this involves that math we talked about before, um, this here. So let's implement this simple arithmetic right now. So we'll multiply 
our number first by the one millionth. So we'll turn that into a second number, not microseconds. So mole SD XMM3 XMM2. Um, and then we can subtract off from our original float for a number of seconds to count down from. So let's do that. Let's move into XMM0, that original number in XMM1. Then we'll subtract off the seconds elapsed so far in XMM3. And this now should basically be printing for us the countdown time. So let's do that. Let's execute this and see what happens. Compile and run. You can see now it's counting down from 15. But that's a pretty big step. And you can see it has the four digits of accuracy that we specified with RSI 4. When it hits zero though, you'll see that it doesn't stop. It keeps going negative. We have to implement some kind of comparison to stop when it hits zero. How do we do that? Well, down here, there's probably other ways to do this, but I like to just set one of those values to um, zero. So px or xmm3, that basically makes xmm3 equal to zero as a floating point number. Um, and then we can compare our current countdown with that. So I can say compare scalar double um, xmm0, xmm3, and then jump above loop. So while our number is above zero, go back to the top of the loop. Let's try that now and see if that works. So again, we compile and let's run this. With a smaller number this time, five. So four, three, two, one, zero. And then it it stopped basically when it hit zero. So that's that's good, that's the first step. Um, I guess you probably could hit that comparison at the top, but it doesn't make too much of a difference um, because what I wanna do first is I want to not print out a new line every single time. So if I change that to a carriage return, is that enough to do that for us? So right here, you can see we're counting down and we did not put a new line in between each single one. We've just overwritten itself. And you can see right when it ends, it ends. So that, that as, it's, as it is, might be enough for you. You might be done with the program right as it is. I wanna add a little bit more though. I wanna add when it ends a little like done or times up or maybe a beep. You can do any of those things. Let's put the word times up when it's done. And so, how should we do this? Um, I think I'm gonna put it in the same chunk of memory here as the grammar. So let's say time trim times up exclamation point new line character and then the leave that there. And so at the end of this, I want to print out that. So right here. I will um, move RSI grammar, uh, move into RDX, how many did, how many characters? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Move RDX 13, call print characters. That will print that out. And I have to also call the buffer flush. Let's do that. And um, that does do one thing though, that messes up this printout here. And so we still wanna print this um, character return out. That's actually gonna be offset now. It's gonna be offset by how much? Um, one, two, so wait, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Okay. And the space is important because whenever you lose a digit on your big end of your floating point number, you have to put it on the back end. And so let's add a space. So let's say at grammar plus 13, print out two characters like that. And yeah, that should, that should be good. Let's see what happens when you run this. Compile, run, five, four, three, two, one, zero, time's up. 
that's pretty much it. We've done everything. I can't think of anything else besides adding some documentation, but who cares about that? Um, so yeah, we've basically enabled ourselves to count down from any user input number of seconds using tick and talk to count the time that's elapsed, printing out, doing some floating point math, printing out the number of seconds that have, we have left, and then looping until it's zero. So it's pretty simple uh, setup here, but nonetheless, perhaps very functional. Now what you would do, which I've already done by the way, spoiler alert, um, in this make bins shell script, you can add a line that basically, whenever you run make bins, it generates this countdown timer executable, makes it executable and uh, puts it in that bin directory. And then you can add that to your system path. So let me show you how you do that. Um, in your bash RC, for example, you can put that bin directory or any bin directory you wanna put it in on your path like this. And uh, in that way, whenever you want from anywhere on your machine, so I can go a different directory like you see here, I can run countdown uh, 20 and it will count down 20 seconds from anywhere on my computer. So that's pretty cool. Um, I guess we're done. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.